Chapter 31, Section 4, Tuberculosis and Leprosy. Mycobacterium is our genus here. Two species, tuberculosis and leprae, causing the diseases, tuberculosis, and what is now referred to as Hansen's disease, but historically has been referred to as leprosy. Okay. Why the switch from calling it leprosy to Hansen's disease? Well, descriptions of the disease leprosy are old as civilization itself. Hell, they even talk about it in, um, you know, the Bible, the Quran, uh, the Torah, many other um, non-Western, Judeo-Christian-based um, religions and their texts talk about people with leprosy. This goes back old, okay? You say leprosy, people take on this immediate negative connotation, negative reaction. And I forget how long ago, how many decades ago it was. They want to get away from that because it is just a disease, okay? It's not this God has smited this person with, you know, which is the connotation that many of our Judeo-Christian, you know, um, texts take of, you know, only the people who are bad got this. So they're trying to get away from that. So that's part of the reason why they changed the name Hansen's to Hansen's disease. Still the same disease, it just now has a new name that the connotation doesn't have a few thousand years of baggage to, you know, to take with it. Tuberculosis, um, you want to read any, you know, Watch any of the old westerns, read any of the old books, you know, about the American West or, you know, even, you know, Edwardian times, if you're going and reading English lit you know, or French literature, they refer to this as consumption, bad consumption. Because if you read, um, they call it consumption, but if you read the uh, description of they coughed a lot, they coughed up blood, they were always sick. You know, well, hey, guess what? Those are the same symptoms as what we now refer to as tuberculosis. When you go and you look at it, it's going to stain gram positive. But remember, it's mycolic acid, not peptidoglycan here. So that's a false positive for the gram stain. You have to use the acid fast. So instead of being alcohol, you have to use an acid to do the same thing. Um, but it's flipped. Uh, gram stain, purple, red, purple, positive, red, negative, with the acid fast, red, positive, purple, negative. So you got to remember it's a flip. When you look at, at its growth, it takes on this weird characteristic growth. And what's interesting about this is I've mentioned it before in lecture. Binary fission, E. coli, staph streps, 15 to 30 minutes, one becomes two, two becomes four, four, eight, and all of that. You know, that generation time. Generation time here for mycobacterium, um, it's gonna be different species to species, but you're looking anywhere from 12 to 18 hours. Yeah, these are slow growers. Slow metabolism, slow growers, which is part of the problem as we're going to talk near the end of this when we're talking treatments. Part of the problems with the treatment. When you look at tuberculosis, tuberculosis is worldwide, okay? Um, some countries, some areas are doing better nowadays at taking care of it. Others, it's just spreading. Um, here in the US, it's still here, it's prevalent but we're keeping it in check because somebody tests positive for tuberculosis. This is one of those things your doctor has to report. I do believe that's either it's that day or that week. There are certain diseases, certain things that when people test positive for, it's immediate by the end of the day, by the end of the week, by the end of the month, things like that. They have to have reported it to the local health department. Local health department kicks it up to the state level, state kicks it to the CDC so everybody can keep track and keep an idea of what's going on as part of, you know, um, them uh, keeping up surveillance of spreads of disease. 
Tuberculosis is one of those they want to kick up very quickly because you need to get started on the drugs. And as we're going to see, you know, here in the States, we do a pretty good job. Other countries, I think right now the big one that we're having problems with and have had problems with over the past couple of decades is Russia, specifically Russian prisons. Um, people go in, they're healthy, bad food, bad environment, highly stressful, immune system decreases, they're spreading tuberculosis around, and they may get the drugs, the treatments. Oh, uh, here's a drug, here's, here's a, you know, your pill. You might get another pill later that day, it might be next week, might be next month. And this is one of those things as we're going to talk about here in a few slides from now, it has to be regimented. You know, certain number of times a day, near certain times, always have to do it. Has to be every day for weeks, if not months on end. And they're not. So they're getting, you know, drug resistant strains because of this, you know, here today, maybe have one in a week or a month. Gets more resistant, they're spreading it, they're getting out. You hop on, I've said this before in class many times. You hop on a plane, you can be anywhere around the world within 24 hours. Step off the plane, walk up to the nearest person who's local, cough on them, spread something to them, back on your plane, and within that 12 to 24 hours, you're back home. This is true. Tuberculosis is truly person to person. Okay, there are no intermediates. There's no, let me cough on a desk. You touch it, you touch your face, now you've got it. No, I cough, you breathe in. There you go. Cell mediated immunity. Okay. Uh, macrophages, monocytes, B cells, T cells, innate, adaptive, does play a role not only in preventing, but also in further uh, um, exacerbating the disease. Turns out Mycobacterium tuberculosis is one of those bacteria that prefers to be inside of one of our cells. It's not an obligate intracellular parasite. It's just that once it gets phagocytized, it hijacks the macrophage, the neutrophil. And where's the best place to hide? In one of the immune cells that's supposed to get rid of you. One becomes two, becomes four, one day, two days, four days, whatever. So it's a slow grower. You can get what's referred to as primary infection and then post-primary. I breathe in, there's this flu-like symptoms. You're going to see that a lot in respiratory diseases or actually quite a few of the infections. They, you know, slight fever, chills, aches, pains in the joints, in the back, you know, things like that. Oh, I think I'm coming down the flu. Ugh. That's the primary infection. After a few days, clears up, but days, weeks, months later, comes back, but comes back harder. Goes away, comes back, comes back harder. So you, that's a primary and the post-primary infection. Primary, patient becomes hypersensitive to the bacteria, it starts to alter. Turns out that the bacteria, its presence, and some of the proteins on its surface, as well as some of the proteins it's excreting, will alter your immune response. After this primary infection, you get this hypersensitivity um, in the immune response, which is why you can get the skin test. Remember, if you've ever had the skin test for TB, they take the needle, they dip it in, you know, proteins, TB proteins, and then they just prick your skin. Come back 24 hours later, if you've never been exposed to TB, there's no response. But if you have been exposed because of the presence of the bacteria, because of what they've done to your immune system, you're going to get this big red welt. Actually was uh, in grad school with, or postdoc, I can't remember, with a student, grad student, PhD grad student from Saudi Arabia. In Saudi Arabia, TB is just one of their endemic. It's one of their childhood diseases. Everybody gets it. His hypersensitivity was such that within the 12 hours after he got the TB test, 
because we were working in a TV lab, so we had to constantly be monitored to make sure we didn't expose ourselves. His ex skin test had overreacted to the point that he actually had an ulceration because the hypersensitivity, the immune response was so bam, actually led to tissue degradation there. So yeah, he tested positive. He tested positive big time. They refer to this as the tuberculin test. You've never been exposed, you're going to give you skin test positive, negative. If you have been exposed, you've had it, well, you're going to show positive, the red welt, or as, that, as uh, Muhammad did, you're going to have that ulceration thing very quickly. And then they have to do chest x-rays to look for spots. Looking for spots, 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 spots. Now, normally, tissues don't show up, or you might get a ghost outline of organs and things like that in an x-ray. Because remember, the x-ray will get slowed down as it passes through you by um, tissues that are more resistant to it. Bones are great at resisting the passage of x-rays. So the areas that you see white, we know as bone, the x-rays were slow to pass through, if not completely impeded. Thus, the x-ray film below it got less exposure at that site. Places that are black passed right through, more exposure, De you know, the blacker, the darker, easier it passed through. So you see white right there. That means you had tissues that have been altered right there. That alteration of the tissues could be, you know, chances are maybe tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, the bacteria grows there. Your body over time tries to wall it off lays down layers around that, literally will seal off that alveolar sac or that area of the lung. You'll see the beginning of calciums and minerals start to deposit there to aid in that walling off. And then that's what you see right there. Could that, you know, can you just go and x-ray some person and find that and say, oh, that's TB? No, because there's many other things that can get down into our lungs that could cause that same type of an activity. Um, asbestos, things like that, can also give you a false positive via an x-ray. What we're very good here in the Western world, US, Europe, is if somebody tests positive, put them in the hospital, okay? Negative pressure room. That means they're in an area that is low pressure. It's sucking air in from the outside of the hallways, outside, you know, so that as they're breathing in and out, what they're breathing out is not getting out of that room. Anyone coming in has got to be masked, you know, have protective PPE going on. Treatment is pretty much, you know, is a not a very difficult to metabolize. Um, low levels of side effects. Got to remember every drug you take has side effects. There's a cost benefit. Okay. Cost is very low. Benefits very high. That's an antibiotic we can take. Cost is high. Benefits a little low. Well, then that's something we need to take into account. Cost very high. Benefit very low. That's something that should never make it to market. Isonazid is one of those low cost, high reward. Let's go. Thing is though, nine months, and this is a regimen, morning, night, or morning, midday, night. And if you're a difficult patient and they're not quite sure you're gonna be taking it as you should, hi, I'm from the local health department, here's your pill. Hi, I'm from the local health department, here's your pill. That's a geriatric uh, chihuahua thinking she needs to protect me from something. Yeah, ignore her, but literally, if you're a patient that's not taking your drugs correctly, the local health department will either somebody from them or they will have a representative, a nurse from a home health or whatever, will show up, knock on your door multiple times a day and say, take this. It's how we do it here. It's how we roll. 
You don't see that in many other countries. In many other countries, they either don't have the manpower, they don't have the drugs, or they just don't give a damn. What we're seeing is that tuberculosis is a big problem with people who have other underlying issues. HIV AIDS is one of those problems. We see a, we saw a big uptick in the mid 90s and for the next decade or so in TB patients, the numbers. And then they looked back and they stepped back and they looked and saw, wow, a lot of these people who are getting TB that normally aren't, weren't getting TB in these populations, these areas, they're also the people who are getting it or testing up, showing up in the hospitals with HIV AIDS. They're already into the AIDS. So that's another that we have to take into account. You have to protect people, not only from themselves, tear your pill, um, but you also have to protect other people from them, okay? AIDS patients, chemo patients, transplant patients, the works, because they have this suppressed immune system or lacking an immune system, and they're going to need to be protected. Hansen's disease, caused by our friend Mycobacterium leprae. And like I said at the beginning of this lecture, leprosy has been around pre-biblical times, okay? There's accounts of it, descriptions everywhere. Um, there's multiple forms of leprosy slash Hansen's disease. Um, the most serious form is what is referred to as lepromatous leprosy, okay? What we see here is that the leprosy, the mycobacterium leprae, gets in, cut, wound, whatever, gets into the skin, spreads, starts to spread, but it only likes certain tissues. It doesn't want to go core because this is too warm, but what it's really going to like is cooler areas, noses, ears, fingers, Go through, read any description of people with leprosy. And the jokes are, you know, their nose fell off, the ears fell off, their fingers fell off. Well, their fingers didn't fall off. Uh, one of the things with lepromatous leprosy is that as it, the bacteria collects in the fingers, their presence causes a deadening of the nerves. If your fingers are numb because of deadened nerves, you can't feel stuff. So you end up banging your fingers harder and harder, trying to get some feeling. Am I touching something? Yes or no. That repetitive banging will over time lead to remodeling of the bones. The presence of the bacteria there, not only do they deaden the skin, but the inflammation due to the presence of the bacteria being there will lead to tissue remodeling. Um, there have been reports, and I haven't followed up on this like I should, but mycobacterium leprae, there have been some scientists are saying that it produces exoenzymes, exotoxins that will also instigate remodeling so that you're not losing your fingers. It's just this constant remodeling of the tips. As the tip remodels and it gets shorter, well, guess what? The bacteria is there, and it just moves along with the new remodeled tip until basically you're under with nubs. Turns out leprae really likes Schwann cells. Where are the Schwann cells? The Schwann cells are the cells in the tissues that wrap around and protect neurons, nerves. So they're not interacting with the nerves themselves. They're not interacting with the epithelial cells of the skin itself. They're in the Schwann cells. You damage the Schwann cells, you leave the nerve cells open to being damaged. So the nerve cells die off, pull back. You lose feeling because now the terminal end of the nerve is now back here instead of up here. You start banging, you get remodeling, and it just kind of moves back, back, and back. You see right here, picture of 
somebody's right hand. That would be the thumb, index, middle finger, ring finger, pinky. So you're looking at the palm. You get the tissue remodeling, you get tissue necrosis because they're constantly banging and stuff. And when it comes to the face, you get these bulbous growths. It's all, because you gotta remember, this is all highly innervated, so you can move, you know, the muscle, neuromuscular, also sensitive. You know, it's very sensitive, your face, because you got a lot of sensory nerves there. So, all those Schwann cells, places for leprae to grow. Likes the skin, likes the nose, likes the ears, especially here, because it is cooler. It's not gonna be so much on the trunk big parts of the arms and the legs, hands, feet, face, ears, nose, perfect. Uh, luckily, leprae, leprosy, Hansen's disease has never been a big player when it comes to the global setting. Yes, it is global. But it hasn't been big like, you know, the Black Death or anything. Because this is a slow infection. Um, what we have done historically is somebody shows signs of being having leprosy. We've ostracized them. Leper colonies, you've heard of them. They'll kick the people out of the village, go live in a cave, stuff like that, before they get to a point where they can really spread it person to person. Um, in the U.S., I think they get about 200 cases a year. The majority of those cases, people have traveled to areas where leprae is still highly endemic. Um, it's a really, leprae, uh, before I end this, leprae has a really cool story with it. Um, uh, one of them, or a couple of cool stories, one of them is how hard it is to culture. Turns out, leprae is one of those that is very, very finicky. We find leprae in two places in the natural world. In human patients that have leprosy, and the only other place we find it, the foot pads of armadillos. Yeah, armadillos, the ones, those things that you see, you know, every so often around here as roadkill, head down to Texas, see them everywhere. But yeah, there, two places you're gonna find it. Humans and the foot pads of armadillos. Uh, the last cool story, um, God, I can't remember the name. Uh, one of the um, more well-known leper colonies is one of the small islands in Hawaii. Um, for some reason, leprosy hit the uh, Pacific Islanders really hard you know, over a few decades. And they just kind of, you know, how I said, they just ostracize people. Get out of the village. You're unclean. You're dirty. We don't want you around here. Whatever. And that unclean, dirty, that uh, that's more than just the Christian religion and stuff like that. Many of the other religions also ostracize people with leprosy. Um, anyways, so they had a leper colony. It's in small island Hawaii. Not much going on for it. People were suffering. Um, a uh, Catholic priest showed up, and I can't remember his name for the life of me right now. But anyways, Catholic priest decided it was his mission from God to care for these people, these basically thrown away people. They've been thrown away, ostracized, told that they are basically worth nothing now. So he's there taking care of them. And the people were very happy in case somebody gave a damn about us. So he went there and he did it. He helped them. And, you know, supposedly the story goes every day, you know, he'd gather those who wanted to come around and would have, offer up a prayer. Here's a sermon, you know, trying to uplift, you know, yeah, your life's bad, but it's not as bad. You're still alive. You still have life. You still have joy. And, you know, from what I've read, many of the patients, many of the people there in that leper colony enjoyed it, enjoyed it. But there was always this 
small minority who, you know, who does he think? He doesn't understand. We have this, we have this, we have this. Until one day he showed up to do his prayer and his morning sermon. And instead of saying, you know, you, you people, you, you poor people, you, blah, 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 you lepers, he started off the sermon with we. We should be happy. We lepers, we, we, we. And then it dawned on the, the patients, the people he was taking care of. He was one of them now. He had been around them. He had been taking care of them. He had been offering them sustenance, offering them shoulder to cry on. But he was healthy. But now he's caught the disease. He is now one of them. And for the life of me, I can't remember his name. I really should look that up. Anyways, I thought that was an interesting story of just how some people can give a damn.